This is our annual gender panel. This time we're going to focus on missions. And so we have assembled some wonderful people working in missions that you may know and love as I do. Each panelist has selected a number of questions to respond to as we explore the topic of women's gift-based ministry. I've asked Jeanette, my sister here, to open us in prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for the fellowship with one another. We thank you for what brings us together, and we ask that you might be pleased and glorified by what happens here in the panel and by what happens in the conference. So hear our prayers as we offer them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Each panelist here will spend no more than three minutes telling you a bit about their life, their ministry, and how the Lord called them to the work they currently do. We will start with Jeanette and work all the way down. Speaking to Mike, this is my problem. This is always my problem. <laughs> is it, are we on? No. Yeah, it's on. One, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try this. I could recite the third stanza of the national anthem for you if you want it. <laughs> oh, thus speed ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. No, okay. Somebody else is following. Yes, you were following me. I'm Jeanette Yep, and I'm currently a pastor of global and regional outreach at Grace Chapel, which is a church northwest of Boston in the suburb of Lexington, you know, where they first shot a bullet. Um, prior to coming, I just, I'm, I'm new, I'm newly minted pastor, uh, you know, another uh, pseudonym for me would be missions pastor, and I'm new to this. I've, before this, I was on InterVarsity staff um, in the U.S. and served for 30 years with students in Boston and then also in the Midwest and did things nationally as well. And the last three years have traveled quite a bit internationally with the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, um, working with younger leaders in places like Central Asia and Africa. Uh, Europe and places like that. So um, I felt God's leading out of the parachurch world, out of InterVarsity, after one month shy of 30 years, which I think would have gotten me the gold watch. <laughs> <laughs> but one month shy. And then I joined the staff of a local church, and I would call it a big white church, which is very new for me, which I didn't expect, but God has a great sense of humor. Um, why am I there? Um, I am there largely because I want to, I, I love the fact of helping people gain God's heart for the world. And I think at a church like Grace Chapel, you have the real privilege of moving people and widening their horizons and helping them use their time, talents, and treasures in stewardship for kingdom building. And um, I'm excited about that. And I've been thrilled to hear adult stories of conversion. And I just got back from Malawi with a group of adults. And, and golly, God can work with adult believers as well as college student believers. So here I am, a new convert. <laughs> My name is Lori Lutz, and this lady had everything written out, so you can see how organized she is. I have nothing written out. <laughs> but um, as I look back, what am I doing now? I guess I'm doing what I've been doing for the last 50 years. Uh, I tend to be an activist in whatever I'm involved in. So when I was in South Africa for 22 years, I worked very closely with African young people and was looked upon as sort of a radical because I didn't approve of the apartheid government. And then I came home, and I didn't know anything about egalitarianism then, and then I came home to the States and I began devouring all the wonderful books that I've learned about from CPE and became an activist for women. And people always look at me slyly when they talk about women and they chuckle. You know how they do when you start talking about women? If somebody makes a little sly remark about you, but that's okay. Uh, I believe that God has called me to call women into ministry. And so I worked for 10 years with the AD 2000 movement, uh, heading up the women's track and was able to encourage and meet these wonderful women all around the world and learn from them and to see them blossoming as they use their gifts. And then as I've gotten older, I've really become concerned about the fact that so many older women especially have given up and they're not doing anything with their lives and they think that it's time to quit when you retire 
And uh, so my desire has been to see women, especially as baby boomers are moving into the empty nest and then the retirement and then what do I do with mother and all that area. And so I don't know, I, I don't know what I'm going to be an activist for next because I'm in a retirement community now, but we're trying to wake up people there too. And I thank God for the opportunity to even use um, some of my interests to stir the pot there. My name is David Hamilton, and I get a chance to speak in lots of places around the world, and I know you always want to know something about the speaker, but not too much. So here's the 15-second version. I was conceived in Bolivia. I was born in the United States. I was born again in Mexico. I was filled with the spirit in Peru. I was called to missions in Holland. And since then, I've been to another 178 nations. That makes it 183 for gospel purposes so far. Uh, I grew up as a missionary kid in the Andean um, mountains. Um, my mom and dad worked among uh, tribal peoples and was just a wonderful example of partnership. Both of them are ordained pastors and uh, they model both the preaching of the gospel and the demonstration of the, the love of God. And I've been married for, let's see, it's 29 years, seven months, and uh, uh, 12 days oh today. I have, I have four children, um, aging from 25 to 19. Uh, they all work in the organization I'm involved with, Youth with a Mission, YWAM. So they're all staffed currently in four different countries on three continents, China, Bulgaria, Switzerland, and Hawaii, well, where I live. I've been with YWAM for 30 years, and we don't give gold watches in YWAM, so I, um, and uh, I serve as the Vice President for Strategic Innovation for our University of the Nations, which has campuses in 500 locations in 140 nations and courses in 92 languages. So I just flew in from Beijing last night. It's four o'clock in the morning, my time. So if, it's a, if I stutter, it's because of that. Why here? Why now? Um, my whole life has been involved with missions, either being a son of a missionary or missionary, married to a missionary, parent of missionaries. The more I think about it, the Great Commission is the way we romance God. It's not an obligation that we have to fulfill, it's how we express our most intimate passion and love for Him. When you really love someone, you try to discover what their greatest dreams are, and you live to make those dreams come true. God's dream is that everyone should hear, everyone should know. Sometimes we, when we think of 1 Timothy 2, we think of all of the problem parts of it. But that passage starts off with this desire. That this is the will of God that he wants all persons to be saved. That's why he sent Jesus Christ as a person, to be a mediator between God and all people. And that's why we're here. And the only way we're gonna get that job done is if men and women together and people from all cultures and all generations commit their hearts to make God's dream come true in our generation. So that's why I wrote Why Not Women, together with our founder of our organization, YWAM, uh, uh, Lauren Cunningham. That's why I'm with you. It's a real privilege. My name is Chad Seagraves, and my wife and I started an organization called 1040 Connections about eight years ago. And 1040 Connections is based in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we work in the 1040 window. Are you familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. 1040 window is latitude lines 10 degrees to 40 degrees, has half the world's population, and 95% of the world's unreached people groups live inside that area. So we work in areas of church planting, slum revitalization, rescue, rehabilitation of women at risk, girls at risk. And um, I really uh, enjoy this type of work because I see that this is fulfilling Jesus' desire, like David was saying. Like in um, John chapter 4, when Jesus speaks to the disciples, he says, lift up your eyes. And uh, when I read that passage, I, I think of two reasons that your eyes are down. One is, is either you have a, a vision that's going about this far, and Jesus says, lift up your eyes, lift up your vision, get a bigger vision, see what's out there, and then our local problem may seem a little smaller. Or secondly, if our eyes need to be lifted up, our eyes may be closed, and so it's time to wake up. And I think um, I like the title of 
CVE's newsletter on the on the online. It's called Arise. And less than I often sign our, our emails, world Christians arise. It's time to wake up. It's time to become alive. And uh, one, of the, one of our favorite Indian doctors says, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, is a sleeping giant. It could change the world if it wanted to. And so part of our job, part of our joy is waking up the body of Christ, letting them know what's out there and what God is doing in the Middle East, in India, in China, using both men and women to... Uh, to announce, display his kingdom, both in word and deed. That's why we do both the church planning aspect and the slum revitalization in a holistic fashion. So, very glad to be here on this panel. My name is Jane Overstreet, and somehow I ended up between Chad and Leslie. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I, like, I love them both, so it's okay with me if it's okay with them. Um, I work with an organization called Development Associates International that was born out of Eastern College about mm, 14 years ago now, 13 years ago. And we work with uh, Christian leaders across the developing world, helping them grow in their integrity and their effectiveness. And it is the most fun job in the entire world because you get to spend time with some of the most amazingly committed leaders who are making a difference in missions across the, the developing world in the most difficult circumstances, um, devoted, um, sacrificial, and I learn from every one of them every time I'm out doing something like that. Um, my passion with this is really to see the church be much more of a reflection of God's kingdom than it is the culture around it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's the other way around. And if we could do that, we could make the difference that Chad was just talking about. That's why I'm passionate about missions, passionate about what I do, and also about CBE. Yeah, we're hoping that this does not signify any problems in our marriage or our <laughs> ministry, we're hoping. But um, yeah, my name is Leslie, and I work with Chad. We have an organization called 1040 Connections, and our passion, passion as an organization is to cultivate connections through contextual ministries so that the kingdom can go out to all of the unreached people groups. And so we focus mostly on India and China and a little bit in the Middle East, a little bit with some projects. But our desire is to see connections take place in different, on different in different strategies basically we really have a burden to see the local church in america in north america to wake up like chad said to really gain a passion for the heartbeat of god which is the nations and we also have a passion for the unreached people groups in the world to have an opportunity to respond or to reject jesus we just want them to have that choice and I think that the biggest glimpse I had of God's heart for the nations came when I was in Central Asia when I was 21 years old. And I was standing on a rooftop and I was just talking to God and all of the electricity in the city goes out at 11 o'clock p.m. So it was very dark. And the physical darkness made me really reflect on the spiritual darkness. And as I stood there, I just had this conversation with God and said, God, I, I really want to go home. This is so hard. I'm surrounded by Shia Muslims. None of them have ever heard the true story or seen a true reflection of Jesus and his kingdom. I'm lonely and I'm ready to go home. And as I stood there as a 21-year-old, I just really felt God's spirit speak to me. And he showed me, he said, what you feel in your heart is a very small part of what I feel in my heart when I look at these people. I was amazed because here was the God of the universe saying, what you feel is barely anything compared to what I feel for the nations of the world. But then he asked me a question. He said, Leslie, will you share the burden with me? And I realized that here was God Almighty asking me to be his friend, his friend that wanted me to share with him his burden, whereas for 21 years I had asked him to share my burdens. And as I've reflected on that over the years, I've realized that God has asked me to share the burden, but he also wants the local church, the universal church, to share his burden. So with that passion for the unreached and for the local church, we started a ministry called 1040 Connections, trying to connect the North American church to what God is doing in the 1040 window and how we can join in strategies that the indigenous believers are doing so that the word and deed of the kingdom can go out so that all peoples can know him. Thank you. Lori Lutz. 
can you share briefly uh, a bit about your egalitarian conversion in the context of your passion for missions and evangelism? Well, mine started a long time ago. I was working in South Africa with my husband among African young people in Soweto and had a tremendous passion to see them reach out and use their gifts for God. And at the same time, the mission asked me to teach in their local Bible school. And I had, in that class, I had African pastors who were older than I was, as well as young people. And I began to feel very troubled because I would hit passages like the Timothy passage and I think, what am I doing teaching, not only teaching here, but teaching men, teaching pastors? And was this the right thing just because the mission asked me, just because my husband said it was okay? Because at that time, I was a sort of a middle of the road complementarian. I didn't even know the name at that time, but I was just waffling. And it was only when I got home back to, from South Africa in 1977 that somebody, a friend of mine, told me about CBE, which was then in its very baby stages. But I read every book I could find. I listened to every tape. I, I went to conferences. I was so hungry to find out had I been doing the right thing or not. And it was wonderful to come uh, to come to the conclusion that biblically, stand on the firm word of God, and I could still teach, I could still minister, and I could still lead. And that passion has not left me at all. And um, but it was it was a difficult time for years because I didn't have anywhere to turn. Thank you so much. This question is for Leslie. Do you see, Leslie, a connection theologically and spiritually between the ministry you're currently involved in and your commitment to gift-based work? Absolutely. I really, when I look at the idea of gift-based ministry, I don't really see it from just a justice perspective or a desire to see equality between men and women. I actually go into a different way and say I believe that it is a key to, to accomplish the Great Commission. And I think justice and equality are things that come out of that, but I really see it as a strategic way to get the job done that Jesus has asked us to do. So because of that, our whole ministry is designed around trying to help empower both men and women to use any gifts that they have. And we actually are beginning to start a new wing to our organization called Ish Isha, which is trying to really demonstrate the connection God wants to see take place between males and females for the sake of the Great Commission. So a lot of the strategies we're doing, whether it's to empower, um, this past year we were able to help 305 women be trained as church planters with 1,065 churches started. Whether it's ministries like that or mentoring or simply just modeling it as we seek to have marriage and ministry together, we're trying to demonstrate that the gift-based ministry will definitely propel the Great Commission. And we, I don't want to say it to, you know, um, people's head or anything, but I really believe it is the vital key and possibly the last key in order to break open unreached people to the Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim worlds. At the reflection of this type of kingdom, once it's reflected and it's modeled by the Trinity, I believe it will be a key to strongholds in those areas of the world. Thank you so much. Jeanette, have you ever encountered racism because of your commitment to biblical equality and how have you managed to deal with I've been long enough to have too many stories, but I'll just tell you a few of them. Um, as a student worker with InterVarsity, there were many times when uh, this issue of gender would come up. I remember the first time when I was serving as a staff worker at MIT, my staff director wasn't going to go to the conference because I was one of the speakers. And my staff director, the other for a week long student worker, InterVarsity staff worker, heard I was the Bible teacher. He uh, invited his students to choose another week to come. I was teaching at a Sunday school. We were working our way through Habakkuk, and one of the um, folks got the ear of the, of the him that I was teaching men and not teaching the book anymore. So the pastor pulled me from the Sunday class and asked me for my notes so that that man could finish for the remaining few weeks. And just a couple weeks ago, I was in Malawi with the, my first mission trip. I'll introduce national director was supposed to, I've been told in the past, he always greets the whole team. He didn't come that time, and I wondered if it was because the three of us leaders were women, and if he felt uncomfortable because of that. So, you know, that's something in your head. You can't go up to him, hey, are you a chauvinist? Is that why you come? <laughs> But those are, as you all know, as a person of color and as a woman, you think about those things. Um, my response, right? But you know, where I used to be, and, um, and I waved my fist a lot, and I got into huge theological uh, arguments with my pastor and other friends. And over time, I think uh, God was gracious to me, and I learned to walk through doors that were open. 
and I learned to talk to people in private and not in public, and I learned to honor God by who I am and what I do. And I found that living was the most eloquent argument of, um, of things. And you know, if they get existential angst because I'm a worm and I'm, I'm teaching and it seems to make sense, then you know, thanks be to God because what I want to be is true to his word and an accurate and good teacher of it. And I feel before him that's the most important thing. So that's what I've tried to do, walk through open doors, be obedient, talk to people in private. I know I can control my response, I can't control theirs. So that's, you know, that's a counseling nugget that you get after you spend your $50,000 for counselors. <laughs> but I realized I gotta control me and I can't control them. And so that's, that's what I work for. Bless you. David, how do we cast vision and hope for the future of missions that includes women's God-given gifts on the field? How do we, how do we cast vision and hope? We are probably living in the most exciting time for the expansion of the gospel that the church has ever known. The last few decades have been absolutely phenomenal in church growth around the world, and the next one to three decades promise to be even more so. But there are a few things that have to happen for that possibility to become concrete. One is that the three, to understand, and Leslie already made brief mention of this, that the three largest blocks are the Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim blocks. They're the ones who we should be devising every strategy possible, praying every prayer possible, and attempting every effort possible to reach. In all three of those major religious blocks, women have a second class inferior status. If the gospel that we preach offers them a second class inferior status, there is actually no transformation, no redemption, no change for them. But if the gospel that we preach is that which we see in the New Testament where Jesus comes to set men and women uh, free to be the full to life in all of its fullness, then there's huge, huge hope. Uh, right now, around the world, uh, there are stories and examples of, uh, just like the New Testament, where the first European convert was a woman, Lydia. Uh, nine years ago, I was in Mauritania. And you have to, to capture this, you have to realize that 30 years ago, there were no Christians in Mauritania. Um, 15 years ago, there were no Christians in Mauritania. Not a one. There were no missionaries, there were no pastors, there were no evangelists, there were no churches, there were no Bibles, there were no radio programs. There was nothing in Mauritania. This is not a people group. This is a whole nation. Hmm. The last nation to in, abolish slavery, although it still exists. And uh, lots of racism, and, and women are very much looked down upon. And uh, when we went there in 99, I got to meet the first, first believer in Jesus. She was a woman, like Lydia. God chose her in a very special way. We'd been praying with my wife for many, many years for Mauritania. And uh, one day she was getting ready to go to bed and Jesus appeared in her room and said, hello, I'm Isa, Jesus in her language, follow me. Mm -hmm. The next day she stopped her five prayer, daily prayers to Mecca and began following Jesus. Jesus showed up time after time. She was so delighted when she, every time Jesus left that she would write a poem. Mm -hmm. She didn't know there were any other Christians. She was the only follower of Isa that she knew. And uh, two years after she <coughs> met him, the first missionaries arrived in Mauritania. Another year went by before they met her. And when she encountered them, they said, do you know that there are millions of other Christians? She says, I have no idea. There are all these other followers of Jesus. And there was this book. She says, really, can I have a copy of this book? So she's been following Jesus now for three years and she gets a Bible for the first time and starts reading it. She starts in Genesis and begins devouring it. When she gets to the psalm, she gets really excited because she reads this psalm and she goes to her, her, her book stand where she's kept her journal and she pulls out her journal and she looks up a poem that she wrote on this particular date and it matches that mm -hmm. psalm 
word for word. Then she goes and reads a couple other psalms later on, and she finds another one of her poems, and it matches that psalm word for word. And she saw the reality of if we don't go, Jesus is so desirous that he'll go first, and he's still choosing the weak, the despised, the marginalized, the foolish. In an Arabic society, in a Muslim society, the first one was a woman today. And uh, so we, we have to, there's great hope around the world. I could tell you many more stories, but that's enough to just give the example. Wonderful. Go to Jane here. Evangelicals have a high view of scripture, a passion for missions. In view of this, how do we reconcile 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14, Chad and David? Sorry. Yeah. Was that to me and David? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll start with you. All right. Obviously, Paul is writing to a specific church in a specific time and a specific place. And we ask these questions to our Chinese brothers and sisters because the Chinese house church is a large percentage run by women. They, they're the ones who are leading the house churches. In India, we ask the same question, how do you see these passages? And uh, many of our Chinese friends who are in the house church say, we know Paul was writing to an audience. And if he was writing to an audience today, he might say something different. But to that audience, that's what needed to be said. And so they see themselves as goers. And so they know that the, the word of God is living and active. Living and active. Meaning when it goes into a certain situation, it becomes the cup of water given in a Chinese cup or the cup of water given in an Indian cup as Sundar Singh said. Um, for example, if you go to the Muslim world, you would not start with John 3.16 when sharing the gospel because immediately you come across the block of Son of God. Instead, you would start somewhere else. Uh, you may start with the, the uh, substitutionary sacrifice of Abraham and his son. You wouldn't say Isaac at that point. In fact, two weeks ago we were in, we were in India and uh, some of our team were sharing the gospel with a Muslim family. And to make a long story short, after three visits to the family, the, uh, our team was able to show a video called Asha, which means hope in Hindi. And the hope video has a wonderful picture of Abraham celebrating the birth of his son, Ishmael. And he says, I name him Ishmael. You know, and everybody's happy. And the Muslims go, wow, they're, because they're so happy to see that. A few minutes later, he has another son. I name him Isaac. And everybody laughs and yells and cheers. And then the video is a very nice thing. When Abraham takes his son to the mountain, the video only says, and Abraham took his son to the mountain. And as he was about to sacrifice his son, and the video never says, which one it is. The Quran says it's Ishmael. The Bible says it's Isaac. And so if you nail down that point, you would create a block. And so as we contextualize our approach in ministry, when people come to Christ, and in fact, that night, one of the men in the family, his name Muhammad, he said, tonight, Isa speak to me. Tonight, I follow Isa. And we asked to clarify, are, do you mean with your whole life? Or are you just saying you like the video? He said, no. He said, speak to my heart. I follow Isa forever. This was two weeks ago. And so this is contextualization, which overrides the, doesn't override it, but shows that God speaks into the people's culture and in the specific situations. Thank you so much. So the question is about uh, the scriptures in 1 Timothy 2 and and Corinthians 11 and 14, I believe. Um, I spent over 3,000 hours in a five-year process studying those 45 verses contained in those three passages. And probably this next three minutes, I won't be able to share all of those insights with you. But you can, you can buy Why Not Women and a, a lot of other very good books right next door on that. But I think the reason why there are corrective elements in those passages is that for the first time in the New Testament church, women were included and treated as partners and given a role alongside men. They never had the educational opportunity. Religious uh, practices among uh, Greeks and Romans and Jews was very segregated along gender lines. 
and they were coming into a whole new newness. And both men and women received correction in both of those passages. We often only focus on the correction that women receive. But you look at the Paul had to bring correction to both. And here's the key thing. God, uh, Paul just assumed that men and women would be working together. He saw it in his good friends Priscilla and Aquila. He commended his, his, one of his lead disciples, Timothy, to listen to his mother and grandmother and appreciate the discipleship that he received from them. And though Paul mentions more men as co-workers by name, if you compare the ratio, I love doing math, if you compare the ratio of co-workers, a male co-workers to all males mentioned by Paul, and female co-workers compared to all females mentioned by Paul, he mentions about twice as many men as women. But his, the, the women are uh, double the percentage that he treat them as co-workers. He just assumed that they would be full partners in ministry. Over the last 150, 180 years of the modern missions movement, 60% of all missionaries have been women. They, the great advance of the gospel has been due in, in a great measure because of the sacrifice, the obedience, the love of countless, countless women. And uh, to ignore that is to ignore scriptural foundation, to ignore uh, the history of the, of the church, and to ignore the fruitfulness of the spirits working in and through the lives of many servants. When I think of uh, Jane and know what she's doing and, and Lori's incredible legacy, uh, I go, how could anyone say that God who designed us all, male and female in his image, can't use all? You know, final thought here. If we're going to get the Great Commission done, it's going to take all of us. If I grew up in South America, so soccer is my sport of choice. And if you may not know soccer very well, but um, Brazil is like the top team in the world, almost always. <laughs> and if, if they get to the World Cup final, even though they're the top team, if six of their 11 players are sidelined just before they go out on the field, they could be playing the United States, a much weaker team. Okay? Or Canada. I won't even go there. <laughs> but they would lose. Why? You can't win when half of your team is sidelined. If we, uh, just for very strategic purposes, realize if we're going to get God's dream done, all God's people must be involved. That's the only formula for victory. Thank you. Jeanette. There are many young people who feel the call to missions, but worry that gender might exclude them from positions of leadership. What advice do you have for them as they prepare themselves spiritually and personally for service? Well, as an older person to you younger people, let me just tell you a few things. <laughs> oh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was just to go through open doors and uh, to serve and learn from as many people as you can and also to learn from bad examples as well as good examples. You can learn as much about what you don't want to be as what you want to be. And a lot of times the hard situations we find ourselves in are places where we learn what we don't want to be like. And that's still um, used by God in His sovereignty. Um, I always tell my 20-something friends to try everything, to try as many things as possible. Find out what you're like and what you're interested in. Find out what your passions are. Don't lock yourself in yet. And then slowly, God will, I think, if you are obedient and you, and you listen to the counsel from friends in the community, you figure out a little bit more shaping influence about what you're better at. And then that's the doors to go through, the, those shaping points. But in the beginning, try it all. You know, figure out if you can speak to thousands or speak to one. You know, do the whole nine yards. Um, and then find the place where God has equipped you. And then I think there's an importance in finding mentors. This generation loves mentors, and I think that's important, whether it's a mentor individual or mentors persons, plural. I've always had plurals where I've taken wonderful things from a lot of people that God has given me and have learned to learn from their examples. Some I've known by flesh and blood, and others I've only known by, by reading. Um, Ron Sider is one of those folks that I've known mostly by reading. Uh, but he's been a mentor to me through his, um, through his instrumental book, Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger, when I was a young student. So some people you get by books, some people you get by flesh and blood. 
And then what's always great is to find some people who believe in you, who encourage you, who ask you questions, even hard questions, who stimulate and challenge you. Um, that's great. If you just surround yourself with people who think you're the best thing since sliced bread and tell you that all the time, that's okay. But you need a couple people to point out that, you know, this place isn't that sliced bread that need working on. So that's right, you know, try it. Try lots of things, learn from people, and um, God will be with you as you follow in obedience. He, he loves it when we are willing to be obedient and we're following Him. That's it. Thank you, Jeanette. Good job. Um, I would say something really similar to what Jeanette said. Um, I would phrase a little differently maybe and just say trust God. It's really amazing. He's much more worried about you using your gifts than you are. Um, and it's almost like child raising, those of you who have children. He's much more worried about taking care of them than you are. Uh, but it's hard for us to believe that as we, because we love him so much. The same thing's true of your gifts. He won't lead you where he won't open some doors. Um, and I can say that because it's happened all my life. I've been in missions for 30 years, and I'm constantly amazed at the doors he throws open. Um, and, and most of them, if you've been looking at it from the outside of, gee, should I do this? Is it going to work? Is it going to be safe? You wouldn't have walked through them. Um, on a practical note, look for places where there are women in leadership and ministry, that they're being used. Uh, because that's your best indicator, no matter what anybody says. And also look for sympathetic, um, I would say, field leadership. Even if the organization isn't so warm on a gender basis, there may be individuals who are working throughout the organization who will throw open doors for you, even if it's slightly against policy. It can happen. Uh, but most of all, trust God. Um, he's, he's doing amazing things throughout the world with people who would you know, never have believed these things could happen. So relax and just give it a shot and see what happens. Leslie. Thank you. Where do you see new trends in mission as it relates to women's service beside men? That's a big question. I'm going to break it down a little bit and just say trends I see in India. And then I'm going to say with that, India is a place of paradox. So whatever is true in this place, one minute away from you, it's different than that. So it's, India is very complicated. Um, to tell you what I see in India, trends that are happening in India, I want to give you a brief story. I was on Delhi University's campus a couple of years ago, and a student on the campus found out that sometimes Chad and I teach about marriage. And she came up and she said, I heard you teach about marriage, and I also know that you are a Christian. She said, I have two questions for you. She said, in my nation, Islam and Hinduism sees men here and women here. And she said, my question to you is, in Christianity, how does God see men and women? Where are they? And then she said, my second question is, what do the followers of your religion practice in regards to males and females? <laughs> yeah. A very good question. I think it demonstrates the reality of the fact that what we demonstrate in our ethics and kingdom living is something that can definitely help the Great Commission. Because we will reflect God and we'll reflect his principles through his kingdom. And people want that. People desire that. And as we have been involved in India for the past eight years, we look for indigenous partners who believe in gift-based ministry. And God has them there. In a place where there's so much female oppression, there are Indian leaders that believe that men and women should partner together. And just this past, when we got, we were in India for five weeks and we worked with people in the foothills of the Himalayas that believe in gift-based ministry. We worked in Mumbai, the urban settings of people believing in gift-based ministry. And we worked in the village setting with people, again, believing in gift-based ministry. So when I talk about India, the trend I see in India, it's not all of India. It's just in what our organization happens to partner in. And I can tell you that there is a trend to try to empower men and women to work together. Not to promote women above males, but also not to allow them to stay where they are underneath males. And some of the movements that we're involved in, as I said earlier, 305 women were trained last year as church, planting, as church planters and 1,065 verified house churches were begun. This year the goal is to, to equip 480 more women as church planters. There is an amazing response to people, and these house churches include both males and females. It's not just groups of just women meeting in houses. It's males and females. In an urban setting where we're working, we're working with some co-pastors, a male and female husband and wife um, co-pastors in the urban setting, and all of her work 
is going amazingly well. Um, and his work is also, but they're finding that women are very strategic in the nation of India. And just one of the trends that I see in India is the fact that they have so much urgency for the gospel. And it, what it is doing is it nullifies this, this need to have a debate about the scriptures. Instead, they're allowing what they're seeing and the urgency of getting the gospel out. They're seeing the laborers that they're available to do the work. And they're saying, we have got to go back to the scriptures and re-examine it contextually to figure out if it's right or wrong to put the people out where the people need, the, need Jesus. And so that's the trends that we're looking for in India, and those are the people we choose to partner with, people that are show, realizing that it's in the partnership of the males and females together that things are happening among unreached peoples. Chad's question, too. Thanks. Same question. Yeah. Okay. Regarding trends, I'll take it from the Chinese perspective, and we've lived there for a while. Actually, we, we live internationally, and we live in Chattanooga as well, so we live where we need to be. But in China, again, like Leslie said, it's hard to make a generalization about the entire country. So in our city, in our, among our contacts, um, what I can say pretty strongly is women are vital in spreading the gospel in China. I think back even to the Bible women, there were hundreds of Bible women who were some of the first, first generation believers many, many years ago. And they influenced people like Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee was instrumental in the Little Flock movement. And then Watchman Nee came to the West and got his education, went back and stopped all the women from being church leaders. So, but then he would still sit behind the curtain and listen as the American woman missionary would give her sermon. He would take notes and then go deliver that in his house churches. So there's a history there. But now in the past 20 years, the 80s and 90s, the church, the house church specifically, has been flourishing starting in the eastern provinces and now moving into Shangxi, Yunnan province, moving across. Of course, the vision of the Chinese house church is basically the uh, Back to Jerusalem vision. We don't call it a movement, but we call it more of a vision because God has given this vision to numerous people over many generations. And the idea, is, as you probably are familiar with, is that the Chinese want to take their part of the Great Commission, which is reaching the Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim worlds, taking the gospel full circle, back to Jerusalem and they want their part in reaching the the Kashmiri Muslims and the, the people in Iraq and Iran and all the way across uh, the Bhutanese the ne Nepalese and so part of our job is also helping helping introduce our Chinese brothers and sisters to uh, the leaders in these other countries and so as we see Chinese people desiring to cross culture um, the question comes how will they do it will they do it in a monocultural way? Will they do it in a culturally sensitive way? Will they go over and think, just like it was done in China, it will be done in Afghanistan as well? And they're learning how to become cross-cultural, which is a really beautiful thing. We were in a, a training school, I guess about three years ago, and there were 30 people, 15 men, 15 women. And these 30 people were being trained in cross-cultural work. And so the trend was train all the workers and get them ready. What they've realized is they have a huge army of workers ready to go out, but now they realize they put the cart before the horse and they need to equip the churches in China to be the sustaining, sending church that can sustain their workers long term. Otherwise, they become dependent on foreign organizations who are paying the salaries of the Chinese workers working cross-culturally, which, missiologically, that's, that's something you don't really want to do. So now the trend, we're trying to back that up and equip the local churches in China to sustain long-term workers as they send their people across uh, back to Jerusalem in that whole endeavor. Thank you. And, uh, and women have been in vital in the whole process. And uh, one of our favorite sisters, Sister D, is leading a movement of 15 million people. And she spent nine years in prison. This is a typical story. They, all, they often ask, what is your conversion experience? What is your experience with the Holy Spirit? And how much time have you spent in prison? <laughs> These are three key questions in knowing how solid someone is in the faith. But anyway, that's some of the trends in China. Thank you so much. Lori, women are often given greater freedom to use their gifts abroad versus in the U.S. How can we help churches in the U.S. become more consistent? Well, this, this is an area that I've been involved in a little more. I, I left the mission field some years ago and have traveled a lot overseas and ministered, but uh, recently <clears throat> I wrote this little book, actually, to be used overseas, and then it ended up being used here for 
training uh, women in, it's called Lessons in Leadership, which is really just a study, a survey of the whole issue of the role of women from Genesis to today. And um, what I'm finding is that so often women in churches where there are ordained pastors, uh, like the church that I recently came from, we had several ordained women wearing robes, sitting up in front, and then I taught a class, and that was really by just pushing to get the door open. They didn't want a class because they're always afraid they're gonna stir the pot, even if they have ordained ministers. They don't wanna talk about it because there are a lot of people in the church who don't really agree or understand. So we finally uh, got a little class started, and there were about 30 people, and I was absolutely amazed at the responses. Uh, one of the women said to me afterwards, you know, when, Joanne, when I know Joanne is preaching, I don't come to church. And another woman said, when Jennifer is speaking, I don't look, I shut my eyes. Because, you see, they feel that biblically it is not right, but they're going to a church they love, and so they see the women there, but they try to ignore the issues. I just talked to my granddaughter the other day, who was here at CBE last year, and she said, you know, a lot of my friends, they just, we're so used to in the business world, we're so used to in the secular world, women are doing everything. Nobody is, is questioning women's ability. So we just don't think about those things in the church, and they don't know. I was teaching a class at another church recently, and I said to them, now they had women elders, and I said, now, um, what do you say if somebody comes up to you and says, well, Paul says that an elder should be the husband of one wife. How do you answer them? And not a woman there knew, even though they had elders in the church, in their church. Now, if I was going to a church that I really disagreed with their teaching, I'd leave. But they don't leave. They just stay there and close their eyes. So I guess the answer to my question is, we still need to do a lot more of this teaching. We need to do it right in the, in the bastions of where women are, have leadership because, well, I'll give you one more illustration. I was in a class last Sunday being taught by a woman in our church who had just recently been ordained. And she is an egalitarian, but she's taught very gently and she was teaching Ephesians 5. And one of the men in the class said, well, you know, the whole thing is, ever since women have gotten an education and they've gone out to work, the whole family has gone to rack and ruin and look at what hap what's happened in our culture. Well, you can imagine, I had a hard time not really speaking up to him, and I did. I said, you just cannot blame women for what's happened in our culture. It has happened to everybody, not just women. And then somebody else said, well, the, the thing is, since uh, Wild at Heart has been written, we realize that really men have lost their masculinity. Again, it's women's fault. And listen, this isn't a church that gives women every opportunity to do everything. So my long answer to a short question is, we need to keep on teaching that you can be a Bible-believing Christian and that you can be true to the Word of God and you can still be a woman leader. And most of the women don't don't know it, don't understand it. That's Jane's question too. Thank you, Lori. Oh, that was such a good answer. It's so hard to follow, Lori. Um, it's interesting because I actually asked this question to some uh, male African pastors who are friends of mine once because it's, it's really kind of a classic thing that, that um, Western women have been allowed to do teaching and preaching across the majority world as missionaries even though they wouldn't be allowed to do the same thing back home. And it's this, it's this strangest um, oxymoron of sorts, you know? Sort of like if God would anoint them there, you know, why wouldn't he anoint them here? You know, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And the, the African pastors have noted this, and, and so as we were discussing this, I said, why do you think, you know, the, the Western leadership does this this way? And they said, oh, it's simple. And I said, what? And he said, well, you know, women are allowed to teach children anywhere, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, basically, they consider us children. And I kind of went, whoa, you know. Um, um, and they basically all said, sure, that's it, you know. I mean, it was like that was common understanding among them. Um, so there, there's such deep roots to these issues. Um, um, you know, across the world, and whatever we model and, and whatever we do goes so deep into how people understand the gospel. So I would agree with Lori, teaching is part of the answer. 
Uh, one of the things I've been really excited about is that we have a, a course on, on the role of women that happens within a master's degree program in leadership that we run in about eight countries. And it's, it's toward the middle of the program. And uh, we have a lot of denominational leaders in these programs and so forth. And it's been fascinating to watch that as these leaders begin asking the question, why do we do what we do, um, they begin to change. And, um, and we've had several denominations actually change their denominational stance on the issue mm -hmm. as a response to teaching. So it does do some good. It does some, do some good. I just want to say one thing. When I taught the same class in India in May, and after the class, the men repented for not allowing women to use their gifts, but the women repented because they said, we have been just too backward. We just haven't taken the risk to step forward and use our gifts. So the fault lies on both sides. Okay, thank you so much. We're running out of time, and I want to give people in the audience a chance to ask questions. So I'm going to just wrap up with two more. One is for Jeanette. What are some of the unique opportunities and limitations for non-dominant cultures in North American and cross-cultural missions? This is for the folk here with a little more melanin in our skin. Um, <laughs> and I think for many of us, there's a bicultural heritage that um, when, if you examine that biculturalness, it gives us a lot of tools for cross-cultural ministry. Um, growing up, you probably have navigated two cultures or more, um, those dreams at home and at school and that prepares you for crossing cultures in the real world. I think also, there's, you need to, one needs to do a lot of thinking about citizenship and citizenship in heaven. I remember the angst I felt when I took my passport and I thought I was an American. I ended up in an Asian country. They didn't think I was an American. And you know, I thought, who do I belong to? It was, it was some, you know, the emblem was the, was the passport, but inside was, was the turmoil that was reflected. And um, I think one needs to examine kingdom citizenship. And for a person of color, I think, crossing cultures, it becomes a real um, founding principle as opposed to an abstract concept. I think the limitations are when you visit um, a, or you go to a host culture, you may um, be thought of less or more because of your ethnicity. For example, when I was in Taiwan, um, they told me that I could apply to teach English, but they, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, assumed that my English was worse than my friends who looked like they spoke English. And I, and I said to them, you don't know how well they speak English, really, do you? And, and they said, no, but they don't, you, look, you don't look like you could. So, and then on the other side, though, um, when you meet a taxi driver, many a taxi driver in many of the developing world, they take great opportunity to chide people in their car. And I was chided many a time for not speaking Chinese better. You know, how come you don't speak Chinese better? Blah, 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 blah. My parents immigrated, I had nothing to do with it. You know? <laughs> but it goes both ways. So, so your visual or your, your physical um, appearance in a culture, if you go back to a home culture, a culture that is somewhat like home, it can produce a lot of angst too. So I, I really think it's important to embrace um, kingdom citizenship and just be aware of some of those um, limitations and strengths. Thank you so much, Jeanette. This question is for Lori Lutz and anyone else who would like to. What kind of missions are available to older women or women or people who are divorced? Well, uh, I think the divorce issue uh, is probably easier now than it used to be. I know that when I was a missionary in Africa, if you were divorced, you were out of the mission. But I suspect that there is greater opportunity, but I think missions vary and you just have to look from one mission to another. Um, older people, I think there are far more open doors. There are programs now, the Finishers Forum, uh, I don't know how active it is right now, but a few years ago they were having conferences like this just to show people how they could take their retirement years and take their retirement money, which supposedly we all have, and, and uh, go overseas and work as a missionary. And I think there are a lot more opportunities, as well as lots and lots of short-term missionaries. If you want to go overseas, I don't think age is any difference. I tell a story in my seminar about an 81-year-old woman who kept going overseas, and even at 81, she's, no, 86, she was still overseas on a short-term mission trip and ready to go again. As long as your health is good and God has given you the call, don't quit. Thank you. Can any one of our panelists 
encourage us with a story of someone who was a dyed-in-the-wool complementarian and changed their mind? And, and what helped in that change? Um, I, the one I'm thinking of, actually I've got several. I've been really shocked. Um, a lot of the time when people, you know, are stopped and you give them the chance to ask the question themselves instead of sort of trying to throw it down their throats, it's amazing how people will come to a, a good conclusion. So I think as far as methodology, I've noticed that when you ask questions and let people begin to draw their own conclusions, it really helps. I, a pre-story I have to do really quickly. We were, we were talking about um, um, uh, creation and redemption in a, in a class I was teaching once with all pastors in Zimbabwe, and this has been many years ago or else it wouldn't have been in Zimbabwe. But, um, uh, and as we got to the part about, you know, and what did Jesus come to redeem? The whole room said women, because they were you were ready, you know, we'd gotten there and I mean they were telling me the answers to the question. Except one guy at the back stood up and said, Everything but women. And the whole room <laughs> turned around and went, No. You know, it was really interesting because it ended up being a group exercise where they were helping each wow. other see the difference. <laughs> but I do think just encouraging people to ask questions and starting to lead them down the track to open their minds is really the best method. This question is for Leslie. Someone in the audience would like to know how you answered the Indian woman's question about what God thinks and, and what your religion practice is relative to women. I purposely left that hanging. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what I did with her is I first explained what God thought about men and women. And so I gave a very quick answer about God that loves both men and women, both made in his image, all the things you would say. And then what I did for the second part is I just said, there are some followers of Jesus who try to practice what Jesus displayed on earth themselves, and they're trying to demonstrate the equality. That's what Chad and I are trying to do in our marriage. I gave those types of things. And then I said, but there are some followers of Jesus who love Jesus, but who think that there is a hierarchy, that it's males here and females here. So I tried to be a part of the body of Christ and not condemn those that think differently than I do. But I also wanted them to know that every Christian that they met did not necessarily practice what Jesus himself wanted, wants us to practice. So that's the way I handled it. Okay. This question is for Lori or anyone else on the panel who would like to answer. And I think we'll probably have to stop after that. And I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Lori, have you seen a change among the pastors who feel that women cannot teach a class filled with men? Well, it all depends on the church. The churches that I've been in lately, yes, they're happy to have women teach if they're qualified and if they're gifted. But I think we've got, I think we've got the whole gamut here in this country. And so we shouldn't be surprised if there are pastors who don't want women to teach. Anybody else? Had a f David? Yeah, I think <coughs> overall, in, in dip, the answer, of course, is answered differently in different parts of the world. But I think the, the shift of what is at stake has moved. It used to be 30 years ago, or can a woman teach? And that still is in some places. But uh, a lot of places now assume that that's okay, but can a woman be a leadership role? In some places just say, well, deacons, yes. Now, that was not accepted by many places years ago, but yes. And so some of it is trying to get the, the area of contention is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, and more and more is being accepted. What I'm concerned about is that, that often that is not a response to deep biblical reflection, but just following trends of our culture. And as the body of Christ, we should be influencing and shaping culture rather than just being uh, influenced by it. We should be leaders, not just followers. When I think another aspect to that question is, where is the church really growing and alive and blossoming? If you look not only today around the world, so Jane gets to lots of countries, Leslie and Chad do, I get to lots of countries, everyone in this panel has. 
uh, where the church is really growing, whether it's revival or spiritual awakening, it's like going back in history. Every time that that has happened, no matter where it is, there's certain characteristics. There's always great creativity in worship. There's a lot of hunger for the word. There's an emphasis on holiness and personal commitment to Jesus. There's a passion for evangelism and sharing. And there's equality among all the body of Christ across. And that, that those are marks of a new and growing and vital, vibrant movement of Christ everywhere. It happens that three or four generations on, if you don't stay in that mode, then you become getting enmeshed in institutionalized traditional structures and power control issues, and it's lost. In China right now, they mentioned uh, earlier, but I have a friend, she's, she's planted 1,800 churches and her disciples have planted uh, over 15,000 churches. I mean, mm. she's planted 1,800 churches herself in the half of the, in the time when she wasn't in jail. <laughs> I mean, she's a remarkable, remarkable woman. She, she's, in my eyes, up there with Peter and Paul and the whole lot of them. She's amazing. And so, but when the, the spirit is at work, and this is why it's so wonderful to get involved in missions, and why churches in the West need to get involved, not only because we have something to give, but we have also lots to learn. And when in that cross-cultural mix, and you see what God's doing, you see, yes, the body of Christ is at work, and it's healthy, and there are certainly issues, and we need to look at them honestly and deal with them straightforwardly, but Jesus is uh, advancing his kingdom. You. Anyone else? Well, shall, you, shall we thank our panelists?